from their utilities in the areas of managing their energy use, distributed generation, electric vehicles, energy storage, and so on. In the face of all of this, we clearly need innovation. We understand in our industry that it's imperative that our sector begins to develop, test, and deploy new ideas, devices, and processes to meet the needs and expectations of tomorrow's customers and allow us to continue to deliver this amazing just-in-time product we all rely on. So I'm very much looking forward to this morning's panel and hearing the thoughts of our panelists on this important topic of innovation. I'd like to now welcome and introduce David Wolf, our moderator for this morning. David is the co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk Centre for Global Affairs, located at the University of Toronto. I'll pass it over to him to introduce our esteemed panelists and get us started on what I'm sure will be a very fruitful discussion. Merci, and over to you, David. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I want to thank the organizers for inviting all of us for organizing this panel on uh, an extremely timely topic in this country. Um, I'm going to say a very few brief introductory remarks <coughs> and then turn the panel over to the four panelists, uh, each Thanks, of whom will speak for about five minutes, and we will have a hopefully very stimulating exchange. Uh, trying to put some flesh on some of the ideas that we heard in the opening presentation this morning. Uh, what I want to say to begin is it constantly amazes me in this country that uh, we have spent the last 50, 60 years and we have not fully been able to absorb uh, the lessons that some of the great politically, Canadian political economists taught us long ago about the limitations of over-reliance on a resource economy and the dangers of falling into uh, a staples trap or what uh, one of our, our younger political economists uh, recently ref more recently referred to as the carbon trap, which is what we currently find ourselves uh, lodged in. So the, the challenge uh, for us in Canada is really to uh, it, it, it compounds what Jennifer Granham was talking about this morning. It's not just about making the transition out of manufacturing. It's about um, making trans diversifying away from our continued over-reliance on, on natural resources in this country. Uh, a second challenge we have is that we have invested massively in Canada in research capabilities um, over the last two decades, particularly since 1997. Um, the universities, the post-secondary institutions, to some extent public research institutes have been great beneficiaries of that investment, um, but it hasn't delivered the results that many people hoped in terms of translating into new jobs, new technologies, new high growth sectors for the economy, and that rem remains a continuing challenge for Canadians. So one's, it's, it's a challenge that I know um, many of the panelists are concerned with and hopefully we'll hear more about. Um, and the last point I want to raise uh, is I was in St. Catharines on Monday speaking at Brock University where uh, the shuttered General Motors plant in the center of St. Catharines that used to be a lot like the refrigerator plant uh, in Greensville, Michigan, stands as a monument to the decline of manufacturing in the southern Ontario economy. And you'll forgive me for a slight, bringing a slight southern Ontario bias to this. Um, and we have, so we face in huge parts of the Canadian economy, particularly the central Canadian economy, exactly the same kinds of challenges we heard about this morning. And we really, are running out of time to think about what the progressive policy framework is to respond to those challenges, to replace those jobs that have been lost, and to think about how uh, effectively we can create new uh, well-paying jobs in high growth and dynamic sectors of the economy. And I'm hoping what we will hear this morning from our four panelists is a lot of novel, interesting, challenging and progressive ideas on how we should be doing that. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with our first panelist, um, 
Edelgard Bullman. We're very fortunate to have her with us. She's a politician, long-serving politician of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Um, she currently serves as the, um, the vice chairman, uh, the deputy uh, speaker of the German Bundestag. Uh, she served in many different um, capacities in the German Bundestag, uh, particularly as Minister of um, uh, Education and Research from 1998 to 2005 in the Social Democratic Government. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, you, you want me to start yes. directly? Okay, I can do that. <laughs> Um, innovation, uh, innovation matters, and when I talk about innovation, I'm not only talking about the technological development or the impact innovation has on economy, but I'm talking about the innovative culture, because innovation matters for the whole of society. Um, innovation creates opportunities for a better life, and uh, I hope that's what we are talking about today through effective medicine, uh, through um, better working conditions, through an intact environment, through economic growth, and of course also including technological development, but also through cultural and social innovations uh, and development. Having said this, um, I would like to point, point out that in Germany, of course, we are very proud that we think we are an innovative country, not in each field, to the same extent, to be honest. And I think we always have to keep in mind that innovation means to be open for new developments, for better chances without forgetting where you come from. And this I want to give as background for, for what I'm talking about and what I'm saying. The question I would like to raise at the beginning is, when do innovations fail and when do they succeed? Because I think we have to tackle that question if we want to improve our innovative culture. We have to keep in mind that innovations are always, always complex and they are often enough not visible. That uh, is true for technological development but also for cultural development. For example, when I ask you, are you aware of successes of microsystems in our cars or sensors in our cars or nanotechnology in our cars. Just to give you one example, I could also talk about medicine, for example, when I look at all the developments which have taken place. Or I could talk about our different attitude or behavior in our daily life using IT technologies, for example, just to give you some small impacts. Or what will it mean if we really do have a digital medicine for our daily life? How can we control, uh, for example, diseases and so on and so on? So that is, um, they are very often not so obvious and visible. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, innovation policy succeeds not because someone starts a very large project, which some people think and believe, um, but what is absolutely important for innovative culture and to have success in innovations is to set up a value, an innovation value net. And uh, I stress this very strongly because we very often tend to look one dimensional at one technology or one economic progress, but we have to look at the innovation value net and we always have to therefore have to look at it from different perspectives from different uh, um, point of views but it succeeds when for example and now i'm talking about technology because that will be the major topic of our discussion it succeeds when technical process is successfully stimulated in areas that have a cross-sectional impact sensors for example are a good example for it because sensors are not only used in manufacturing or manufacturing technology but in almost er all areas of our daily life and uh, therefore of course they play a major role for an innovative 
product, innovative company, but also for our daily life. Um, there are no blueprints, let me say that as well, for the best way to achieve this. And that's why I can only give you some examples of our Germany experiences, but you have to look at your own country, at your own industry, and then select what is the best way for us, because your country is different than my country. We don't, for example, have natural resources. We have only human beings, and we very much depend and on, when you look at the value innovation value net, we very much depend on people because they are ones, the ones who create a value. So there are differences between uh, countries and I think you have to keep that in mind as a politician. And uh, therefore, again, when I say innovation, you have to look at the value net. For innovation policy, that means it's a um, more or less cross-sectional task. So it's not enough to have a good minister for research and technology, and I know what I'm talking about. You always need, for example, your colleagues. You need the minister for health, for example. You need the minister for traffic, uh, because they are the ones who have, a, and, and their policy has a huge impact whether innovations are used or not, whether they are supported or not. And, and therefore, it's a cross-sectional task. Um, when, when you look at Germany, Germany has a refined research system, but as I said, innovation is not research, innovation is much more. <laughs> Nevertheless, we have a refined search, a research system that is globally unique and which plays a major role, an important role in the innovation process. When you take a close look at our research system and our economy, you realize that it's not the government alone which decides about um, content and objectives of research. But again, it's a, well, a cross-sectional work. We cooperate very closely. We set up, for example, workshops in order to define new research programs and new technology programs, not only once, but several times very often. I did that, my uh, predecessor did that, uh, those who followed me do that, so it's an attitude, it's a culture again in, in our country. And this creates, I would say, enormous scope for curiosity and discovery. And um, we have, and that is the second pillar, we have strong research organizations. You all know Fraunhofer, but it's not only Fraunhofer. We have good re basic research organizations like Max Planck. We have research organizations who cross the border between applied research, which is not there in rea reality anymore, which might have been there, although I'm skeptical about that. <laughs> uh, uh, um, we have HFG, uh, it's Helmholtz Society, you've probably heard about it, the biggest research organization in, in our country. We have Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, which is not, you know, neither basic nor applied, but in the middle. And uh, we have, of course, the German Research Foundation, which plays a major role for all of our universities. And you have to keep in mind that we have more than 300 universities throughout the country with a different pro profile, dif different um, um, cooperation partners, and so on. So this is our, our uh, innovation net. When you ask me what has to be done in my own country, I would like to focus on 10 areas and just give you a short, well, two sentences for each area, because I think then you have in mind what, what is actually uh, should be done. First of all, we have to in continue our efforts to increase investment in R&D. And I say that very clearly. I did then when, when I was a minister, and I'm very pleased that we have done that since, you know, since then. So we now, almost reach our goal 30% of our GDP. We haven't reached it yet, but that is our goal. And I say we must even more invest than, than, than 3%. Because we are a high-tech country, we must invest 4%. That should be our goal. So we have to do more than we did. Um, second, sec and, uh, let, let me say one sentence more to that point. We have to keep in mind that research turns money into innovation. Innovation turns money, turns research into money, and therefore it's a cycle. Research turns money into innovation, 
And uh, then again, innovation creates money. So we have money again to invest in all the areas. We have to move on. S second, second point. Um, it goes without, without saying that innovations of a society, of country, depends um, on s setting and investing that money in an intelligent way in different areas. No question about it. I need to describe that further. Uh, third, the rapid spread and application of the latest key technologies is often delayed or often blocked in my country as well uh, is, as in your country. And therefore, it's, I would say it's almost criminal to neglect social innovations. And that is very important, and we are not always aware about this. Um, next point, the, to make the best of our human resources. I already said we d depend on our human resources, investing in the skill of young people, in the competences, the ability of young people is crucial for an innovative country. And I think neither in your country nor in my country we do enough for that. To say it very clearly, we have to do more. We have to invest more, but not only money, but also intelligence. Uh, next point. Effective research support means more than simply paying out money. Promotion of basic research is as important as promoting financing of applied research and giving also financial support to young companies to start up. Again, it's a shame. It's not only you know, one dimensional. So next point, it's important to look at our today, at our global world, because now, and our technological development, because now we need much more, and we do it actually, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and technology development. When you look at the single develop, uh, technologies, you realize it's not only chemistry, it's not only manufacturing, but it's very often merged, and I could even add some other disciplines. And we have to reorganize our universities to some extent, because they, they really, I would say, they, they got it, and they do a lot, but uh, we have to continue this, because it's not one single step. You always have to look what, what, how do we have to change our department structure, and so on, to pick up this new development. Yes. We must uh, uh, channel our project support strategically. Uh, we can only identify together with business and research communities that the areas that, mostly, that, that are most likely to deliver tomorrow innovations. And we must therefore project, uh, we must therefore focus project funding uh, systematically, uh, systematically on the kinds of technologies that will open up new paths to growth areas and on basic technologies that will act as so-called engines for economic growth. I want to move on to Novena, and we'll come back to some right. of these points in the discussion. Thank you very much for uh, a lot of food for thought. Uh, the next panelist is Novena Robinson, who has led Polytechnics Canada since 2009. The association represents the research-intensive colleges and polytechnics in the, com in the country. Nobina was a member of the Federal Expert Panel reviewing business R&D programs in Canada, also known as the Jenkins Panel, that produced the report in 2011 called Innovation Canada, A Call for Action. And I know she has thought long and hard about these questions and I look forward to her thoughts. Thank you, David. Thank you to Jonathan Sass for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with such important uh, speakers today. I take to heart Ed Broadbent's uh, call this morning. For, doing, for not doing more of the same, and it's time to do things differently. And in its own way, that's what innovation means. And so one of the things I want to leave you with in the brief remarks I have today is we need a 21st century for Made in Canada innovation, and we don't have it. And if your summit is trying to think of the practical ways in which we need to do things differently, let this be your call to action. So I think Edelgard has laid out but let me repeat, science is not innovation. Science is inherently important. We have research intensive universities that do it. Science is a knowledge activity. But innovation is an economic activity. 
and we cannot continue to want innovation but only fund science. There are different points in this continuum from basic research to applied research to experimental development to R&D to commercialization. And each of these need to be understood for their different activity, motivation, and the actors. So the other message I have for you, it is people who innovate to build off what Edelgard is saying. It's not companies who innovate, people innovate. Companies commercialize. And when we get that principle clear, you might actually start updating your toolkit. So, for years now, this inconvenient truth is every time we want innovation, we fund more science. And we have to look at what we're doing to our research granting councils here in Canada. We don't have the size and scale of Germany, but we have very important research granting councils that are doing very important work, but increasingly have been tortured into doing things that were not in their DNA. So that's one inconvenient truth, I will go to the R&D panel report that you mentioned, David. We talked about standing up an industrial-facing research council. We don't have that in Canada, no matter what the changes have been in the last few years. The next inconvenient truth, PhD production alone will not get you innovation. And to substantiate that, let me point you to two very important World Bank reports where we cannot say who are the R&D performers in the country. How many researchers do we have? How many technicians do we have who are performing R&D? Guess what? These are World Bank reports. Burkina Faso can say it. Malta can say it. And in fact, if we wanted to go to actually the countries that we would peg ourselves against, Finland can say they have 7,722 researchers for every million people. Denmark can say 6,365. Korea, 5,481. Canada, not data, not available. Technicians in R&D are not researchers. They do something different. They help commercialization. We cannot report how many technicians are performing R&D in our entire industrial sector. That has to change. So the fact that we don't track researchers or R&D technicians per million people is another example of how we have yet in Canada to acknowledge that research, development, and innovation take different people with different motivations. And this is why it's time to up our game. So we've had decades of talking about the knowledge economy. And the knowledge economy was supposed to be created by highly qualified people, code word for PhDs. The time has come, and that was what the panel tried to do, change the dialogue to highly qualified, skilled people for which we need a diverse set of talent doing R&D. And let me make a plug for what is my conviction. You need teams of collaboration. You need the researcher, but you also need the person who knows how to raise capital, who knows how to build a prototype, who knows how to take an idea to market. We need to get ideas to invoice. So, um, the panel report that has been talked about, uh, much has happened. The government has done a, a, a number of actions to try to improve, but the dial's not changing on business innovation. Maybe we can come back to this later, David, but quickly, the road not taken since the Jenkins panel. Three things have not been done. One. We recommended as a panel that we need to scale up Canada's many subscale programs to support business innovation and make them outcome oriented. Program consolidation, very inside Ottawa Beltway kind of speak, has not happened. Next, we don't use government procurement for innovation. And you had Mariana Mazzucato here last year. It is time to think about how to do better with a legitimate need of a government to innovate and then put the challenge out to the private sector and say, come together, form a company, help government solve its problems. We can get back to that. We need a small business innovation research program in this country. Finally, the machinery is all wrong. We don't have a minister of innovation. We don't have an industrial facing research council. We don't have the, um, the kind of 
steely-eyed cabinet focus that Canada's productivity is tied to its innovation lag. Instead, we have a junior minister of state for science and technology who is not responsible for business innovation per se. And that, to me, is the machinery challenge equally. The research granting councils, as I mentioned, are being tortured to do industry-facing research when it was in their DNA to do science. So we need to stand up a set of institutions that are focused. The UK have business, innovation, and skills. Australia has Productivity Innovation Council. We have a Science Technology Innovation Council that provides confidential advice to the Minister of Industry. Not good enough. So to me, the machinery changes are important. Germany is an example where big science foundations work alongside innovation foundations, as Edelgard just said. I think finally, we've got to stop this idea of take our good ideas and see if companies will receive them to commercialize. We need a demand-driven innovation system. These are all code words, but I'm happy to expand more in my discussion. I think the collaboration piece, when you fund every actor in the innovation system for what they do best, you will actually enable collaboration. Thank you, Nabina. <clears throat> Next panelist is Emma Yanuha, who's the Chief Innovation Officer in the Industrial Retail and Hospitality Division of Xerox. Uh, he is responsible for identifying innovation-driven growth opportunities and accelerating the commercialization of market-connected research, development, and engineering outcomes. Emma. Thank you, David. Uh, I note here that I am the uh, token behemoth, evil, multinational corporate executive <laughs> on the panel. So uh, you're welcome, Ottawa. <laughs> um, the, uh, just before we start, uh, I just want to underscore uh, points that were articulated by no Nobina and, and uh, Eldegard as well. Uh, the whole notion of innovation and even within that technology is really designed to serve the interest of humanity. And on that point, I'm reminded of the fact, um, so in my family, I am a Canadian of Nigerian descent, and my parents came here to escape the scourge of civil conflict and strife and abject poverty. My father was born in a thatched hut that had a tin roof, a zinc roof. My mother was born in a thatched hut that was a little larger than my father's. They lived less than 20 kilometers away from each other. And they left Nigeria to seek out a better life because they felt they could do better from a human development standpoint. And at the end of the day, all of our endeavors are geared towards enabling that forward progress in human development. And 50 years later, in fact, this year, my parents will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. Fifty years later, their children, myself included, are here to say, 50 years ago, Canada said yes to my parents. Fifty years later, my siblings and I, every day, have the blessed privilege of saying yes right back to Canada. And we greatly appreciate that. And I greatly appreciate being here to celebrate being a decidedly Canadian actor uh, in this context. So I want to thank the uh, Broadband Institute for giving us this opportunity and for giving me the opportunity to celebrate being decidedly Canadian in the interest of our democratic framework here today. Um, I, I'll Very well said. The, uh, as, you, as you heard, I'm Chief Innovation Officer in uh, the uh, Global Services Division um, of uh, Xerox Corporation. And we actually innovate through Canada. Um, it, there are many companies that could come up here and represent uh, that drive a great deal of uh, innovation-led investment in Canada, uh, multinationals as well as homegrown Canadian companies, whether it's the Ericsson's of the world, IBM, uh, homegrown Canadian companies like BlackBerry that spend north of a billion dollars every year on research in Canada. My company uh, is, uh, sadly, one of the only multinational corporations within our traditional uh, competitive space that actually conducts value-added advanced materials research in this country under a global mandate. We don't do it for charity. We don't do it because it's exclusively because it feels good, although it does. We do it because we actually create value through innovation in Canada. 
particularly through the Xerox Research Center of Canada. But as uh, my, uh, the previous speakers have mentioned, it's not necessarily the company necessarily that produces innovation. And I, when I say innovation, I should mention that we define innovation as the critical difference between a good idea and a great outcome. It's really about the outcomes. We're about commercialization of research outcomes, not necessarily a preoccupation with the research itself. Having said that, there are cultural elements associated uh, with research and development. We often focus on technology. Technology is necessary but not sufficient to actually achieve breakthrough in terms of innovation and go to market with products. Here in Canada, we have continued to invest in research and development, not just because Canada is a great place to live and work and contribute and grow, but because it's actually one of the single most productive knowledge platforms within our value net. And in that regard, uh, the Xerox Research Centre of Canada, which again has a global research mandate, it produces over 160 patentable ideas every year. That's three inventions a week. That's one of the most productive patent turn rates out of any commercial research institute across any industry. In fact, Xerox is one of the top 100 spenders on research and development here in Canada. But what is the critical success? What are the critical success factors? And as Nobina indicated, it's really about the people who actually have the competencies, the skill, and the attitude and ambition to actually do better. Ours is really about mastering the art and science of advancing the threshold of human achievement. That's why we were able to create the world's first successfully commercialized nanotechnology-enabled product for the print industry. It was actually incubated here in Canada by our researchers. Within that research community, we have individuals that come from 35 countries around the world. Some of the top material scientists in the world come to Canada to work at the Xerox Research Center. Now, part of the reason is because of the infrastructure and the capital that uh, exists and the research instruments that uh, exist there. But I tell you, in keeping with Einstein's observation that everything that can be counted doesn't necessarily count, and not everything that counts can be counted. The secret sauce in terms of our uh, research endeavors here in Canada is really the quality and the collaborative work undertaken by the people within the research center. There are not only skilled and established researchers in their own right, but they also have the critical capacity, which I try to teach my uh, children about, which is the ability to play well together in the sandbox. Collaborative work and a high degree of emotional, social, and cultural agility is a critical success factor. And no amount of money can replicate that, but it is definitely a critical success factor in terms of throwing off the type of productivity and commercialization rates that we see in our research facility going forward. So I don't want to uh, take too much time. I'm anxious to get into the discussion uh, and the, uh, the cross dialogue with uh, my colleagues here. But I will conclude by saying again, the reason we're all here, this is a remarkable celebration of critical thought. I say in a world as complex as ours, where authentic progressive thought thrives, humanity wins. And I'm very grateful to be here to uh, share the opportunity to engage in authentic progressive dialogue with you beyond the partisan. Uh, and I uh, look forward to, uh, to the discourse as it continues on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Our final panelist is Nathan Cullen, who's the Member of Parliament for Skeena uh, Bulkley Valley in the beautiful northwest of British Columbia, and he's been finance critic for the NDP since March 2014. Nathan. Th thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. And thank you uh, for the invitation. I, I'm, I'm still reflecting on some of those thoughts. Progressive, authentic. Um, Dialogue. That's that's pretty good for a corporate guy. That <laughs> I, I, I'm going to totally steal that for speeches. So for those that um, there, are, I think. Not uh, hey, it's back on. For those that doubt that innovation is possible, I I can't remember the last paper jam I had in a Xerox copier. So <laughs> I'd like to, to to thank our friends for that because. 
As a young 16-year-old intern, that was kind of my life for a couple of years. And, I, and I, I honestly can't recall the last time I had to rip paper physically from... <laughs> You're welcome. Nate. You're, you're, thank you. I, I, I thank Xerox every day. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the title of this particular conversation was about boom and bust. And, and here we are again. Uh, I remember seeing in Calgary on one of my visits there uh, a bumper sticker on the back of a car and it's the old, you know, oh Lord, just one more boom. And, and ironically, it, it was sitting on the back of a of a Maserati, a very nice Maserati, and I, and I thought, irony is not dead. Um, yet this crisis, I think, masks an opportunity, and that is an opportunity to rethink not only our, our perspective on energy in this country, um, but the way that we look at economy. The, and, and I should also put that into context, that $50 oil is, a, is an average price over the last 25, 30, 40 years. That this is about where oil has been yet it is interpreted and seen as a crisis, particularly by our government, because we, and the way I know that is that we don't have a budget. Alberta somehow managed to do one yesterday, as did Quebec and others, um, yet we're in a state of shock and, and, and freeze right now. The, it's almost this, this perpetual boom and bust and the shock we experience every time is like, you know, that goldfish swimming around the, the bowl and seeing the castle with such a short-term memory problem that it thinks the castle is new and innovative every single time. We're shocked every time oil prices go up and then suddenly they go down. And then we panic and say, what are we going to do next? And then we have this opportunity in, in that moment of crisis to think about true innovation. And, and not just in the energy sector, but more broadly across what we do. I think Canada has to be more ambitious. I think we have to be bolder. I think we sometimes settle back on this natural wealth that we have that Germany and others don't have and say that's just good enough, that we can export raw materials to the rest of the world and allow them to do the innovation. That when I challenge our government to say we can add value, we can innovate, we can diversify, they say, no, we can't. Labor costs are too high. Or taxes are too high. Some things, there's always a ready and available excuse as to why not to do the thing, which is to be smarter with what we have to be more innovative with what we have. And that we don't need a praying culture, we need a planning culture. You just don't cross your fingers and hope that resource prices get better and then the windfall comes back. We actually need, as, as my friends have said here, thoughtfulness about where we want to go, what we want to be and what we can become as a country when we uh, face the world. So let's, let's put this into context. We've lost about 400,000 manufacturing jobs since this government took office. 400,000. The last 15 months, we've seen less than 1% growth in jobs. That's the lowest growth rate for jobs outside of a recession in 40 years. We have the highest uh, personal debt rate, and we have $650 billion of dead money sitting in corporate Canada's coffers right now that's not being reinvented, reinvested into research and development. We have a uh, myriad, and uh, Nabina will know this well, of innovation programs, some of which, the main ones, can cost the company up to 30% just to apply to the programs. And so the good ones, the best ones, often don't. If you're 30% if you're out the door just before you get a single check, just to hire consultants to apply, that's not a program worth its title. Now I should say a couple of good things about what the government's doing, because I'm supposed to do that, uh, <laughs> apparently. There's an IRAP program that's not bad. It's, it's small, uh, some good in, in, in angel investing and innovation on, on investing. Uh, some more rebalancing on the skills side, that's been good. And James Moore wears some snappy suits. <laughs> uh, I, I, those are the three top things that come to mind. He's a, he's a fine dresser. The, we, we've laid out, the NDP have laid out a couple of planks already on some innovation tax credits, getting at the small business tax rate and a small business innovation fund because we hear that from small business communities. Here's the great advantage we have as a country, is that so many other nations have gone out ahead of us and tried out different ways to innovate, bring more research and development to the market. Germany, South Korea, the Americans, the Israelis, on down the list. So our advantage in being late to this particular conversation is we can pick and choose programs that would apply well that have been tested thoroughly through other nation states.
That's the advantage we have. That and the fact that we, I believe as a country we are inherently progressive and collaborative. And if you read through all the breakthroughs, the great innovative breakthroughs, the internet, cell phones, manufacturing innovations, they've always been done collaboratively. The idea of this lone social reject genius sitting in the lab somewhere coming up with the next innovative idea exclusively alone is a false idea. It has always been done through a scaled model where you have the pure science all the way to the applied. And we have to have a government that believes in science as a starter. That it would be very helpful to, to recognize the value. And let me, let me end on this, David, because I know we want to move on. I think there's probably no better example in industry right now that we look at where the benefits can be so immediately accrued if a government were to focus and believe in the things that we're talking about than in clean technology. That as of 2013 employed more people in Canada than the oil sands did that globally has seen a resurgence and a drop in solar voltaic, photovoltaics of almost 90%, and we've seen almost a doubling since 2009 in Canada of clean tech production. So that's all without an enthusiastic or a government paying attention. Imagine what you'd, you'd do with a government that acknowledges the value of science, believes in the Canadian collaborative progressive model, and will see an innovator and an innovation I guess that's them cutting me off. All right, we have. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Nathan. We have about <laughs> 13 to. Uh, we obviously have a lot to say on the subject. We have about 13 to 15 minutes of our time left. I have about a dozen questions I would like to ask each of you, but I will restrain myself. Um, I'm going to ask each of you what. Um, we'll start with Edelgard. What, if, if, if there were a progressive government elected in this country at the end of the year, a lesson from Germany, top single priority you would advise that government to enact. In, you know, the, the governments famously have the first 100 days of action. If we were to turn the innovation agenda around in Canada and make innovation the centerpiece of a new government's economic strategy, the number one top priority that that government should make a focus in its first 100 days. What would you advise us from Germany? First, first of all, I would uh, increase the investment uh, in R&D, but in such a way that not only universities are financed, but that you have open technology programs which aim at SMEs and that you, that you support not only the development of a technology, but also the networking, because we all talked about networking to a large extent, because that is absolutely crucial. And a lot of programs, when I look at your programs, really concentrate on technologies. We have been doing that since 40 years, but it's not enough. You also have to concentrate and you have to go at creating these innovation nets and innovation cluster. I did that and it was very successful. And we have been doing this since now 15 years and we are going to continue. High tech strategy, all, everything is about cluster building. Cluster is another word for setting up innovation nets. And I would do that and especially address SMEs, but not exclusive. What always is always important is, is to support you know, cooperation and networking of bigger companies and SMEs. And when you look at Germany, our economic success is because of a good cooperation between big companies, SMEs, and a good functioning uh, research infrastructure. And that is, well, to be honest, the success model. And the second point, I would really use much more than at least from, from looking from the German, from Germany to your country, I would much more use public procurement in order to push innovation. And I would like to give you one example. I, I, I visited a research institution in Germany just a couple of weeks ago, which is working on new concrete. You might ask, what is concrete for an innovative uh, country like Germany? They are working on, on um, on technologies where they um, combine concrete and well, well with the solar cells, and it's uh, the, the the hardware of solar cell is in the concrete already, and then you have a surface for the photovoltaic cell. 
And that is not very efficient at the moment, as, as photovoltaic cells, but of course it offers great opportunities and they will be able to bring it into the market. They can only do that if they work together with big companies, or, but also with SMEs, because they are the ones who run the infrastructure. And, and therefore, just to give you this, this example, it's a typical example for a good functioning cluster for something which is not, we are not talking about that in the moment, but we will be talking it about in 10 years time. I'm quite convinced about that. And the, then there again, it's a good example where everything, you know, you, you can see it. You have to cooperate, you have to bring everything together, otherwise it won't be an economic success. But this can be an economic success. Thank success. you. No, Novena. Um, so you've heard me make the pitch for why a new government should have a Minister of Innovation, so you can read about that. Let me use this occasion to tell you about the U.S. Small Business Innovation Research Program, which is actually in some form exists in seven other OECD countries, but uh, building on what Nathan said, since we actually have the evidence, why does Canada not have a Small Business Innovation Research Program? What does it do? It stimulates demand pull, and in this case, government would set the demand. Government would set the challenge, such as timely delivery of medication to remote communities, or unmanned uh, aerial vehicles for remote pipeline monitoring, or improved heating systems for softwall shelters. Smart people working in Canadian firms from universities, colleges, and polytechnics, not just universities alone, would compete to develop a working prototype within three years that solves the problem and could be adopted by government. All firms would be free to commercialize their solution along the way. This same US program brought the world the laptop computer, the Roomba vacuum cleaner, the robot vacuum cleaner, and Symantec antivirus software. Why can't we use government's need to stimulate small business innovation in a collaborative way? That can be done in the first 100 days. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's clear. It's focused. And it's definitely doable. Emme, from your perspective. Well, I think the, uh, the linkage between talent and innovation is critical. Um, you know, a progressive government, I, I would, one would hope, would focus a great deal on trying to create the conditions that uh, allow us to build the future pipeline of knowledge workers. Uh, when I look at the German example, and we employ nearly 3,000 people in Germany, uh, and our business there is quite robust. Uh, it's probably one of the few country markets that is uh, slightly more productive for us than Canada, where we also employ 3,000 people. Um, our outlook really is, is about trying to give young people opportunity to uh, connect with private sector companies going forward. And I think a legitimate early uh, commitment made to trying to bridge the gap between um, the traditional institutions of, of learning and development and private sector environments where informal, non-traditional learning and development can take place, that should be a priority, notwithstanding the jurisdictional issues associated with provincial and federal discourse. When I look at the German example, there are roughly, I think, about three million uh, firms in the United States, or in uh, sure. Germany, roughly three million. And within those three million, fully 41% of those firms are manufacturing firms, and those those, that 41%, which amounts to slightly north of 1,200, uh, if you will, um, 12, uh, 1.2 million firms, uh, all of them participate in the apprenticeship programs and the cross-pollination of young talent and introduction of young talent early into the workplace. Um, when we look at that particular circumstance, the scales are different, obviously. Uh, the number of firms that are labeled as manufacturing firms in Germany actually outstrips all firms that are labeled at all across all industries in Canada. Mm -hmm. But my point is, there needs to be a more deliberate attempt to bridge and formulate uh, a harmonious and mutually productive experience between young people who formulate the future pipeline of knowledge work and the firms that are doing some enduring uh, innovation and knowledge work uh, currently. And there are firms more, uh, you know, obviously my focus is from a uh, material science perspective in terms of the work we're doing here in Canada, but there are a number of firms that are doing some prolific work, but there isn't enough turn. And on that point, I'll conclude by saying, 
we not only believe in that, we try to practice it. In our research center, every year, we employ 42 co-op students. We only have 130 full-time professional staff in that research center. In addition to that, we employ 42 uh, co-op students in applied research areas from research-intensive universities across Canada. And we pay them. Um, and uh, <laughs> and those folks aren't just making copies for Nathan or getting coffee for me. Um, those folks are actually working alongside of some of the world's most talented principal scientists. I give as one example, a little over a year ago, we actually commercialized the next generation of organic light emitting diode technology, a license to which was sold to a smartphone, a global smartphone manufacturer who will remain nameless. Um, the critical IP associated with that technology, which sold for several million dollars, uh, the critical uh, patents associated with that project, two of the names were Canadian co-op students. Now, they probably won't see a dime of the patent returns, <laughs> but the point is they had a remarkable step function in their non-traditional education and training and development and human development experience as a result of being co-located with some of the most prolific thought leaders in our uh, industry and in the area of material science. That's what the government needs to focus on. That's what we all need to collaborate on in the context of what Eldegard referred to as the uh, innovation value net. Thank you. Final word to, yeah. to Nathan. First, first hundred, cancel the annoying ads because they're just driving me uh, mad. The, uh, I, I think it, it, broadly macroeconomically speaking, uh, uh, abandon the, the failed Reaganomics structure that we're under right now that we, we keep seeming to be surprised that the trickle-down theory of economics doesn't work. A shock, I know, uh, having th th them tried and failed it for so long in the United States. And by that I mean, you, you, if you start a program to do something, then that should be the outcome that you're looking for. So if the government comes forward and says, we're going to cut a tax here or start an innovation program here in order to create research and development or jobs, then have that uh, tax program actually tied to the creation of jobs or research and development, as opposed to what we do right now, which is we've cut taxes to marginal rates, almost half of what it is in the United States, because it's the only tool the government has in the toolbox. So they just keep applying it. And if that, if that tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. So they just keep whapping away at it, hoping that innovation and research and development will get better. L lastly, we need to price carbon. And that may be a, a, a strange, we need a polluter pay principle as a foundation of our energy sector. That will spur the innovation that we need in that industry, full stop. Okay. May, may I add one, may, may I add one sentence because uh, I, I didn't say it. I, I gave the example, but what I think personally is really important for your country, but you also start much stronger than you do at the moment, at least from my point of view, to develop sustainable technologies, because I think it's, it's dangerous to, la to rely to such an extent on high energy prices. Mm -hmm. And if you will have a future in the manufacturing sector, and Canada was always very good in, in manufacturing, then the winner of the markets of tomorrow are really energy efficient, resource efficient production systems and machines. And that's why you have, much to, you have to put much more effort on, on those areas than, to be honest, you do at the moment. So if, if I would give an advice to a new government, I would also try to give them this advice to keep that in mind and to combine it, what we set on setting up a new funding structure and giving more incentives to innovation. Thank you. I, totally agree. I want to take one, we're out of time. I want to take one minute to wrap up. I think if you were to take a uh, takeaway message from what we heard from the opening plenary this morning and the four uh, extremely thoughtful and knowledgeable panelists we've just heard from now, um, there is a clear doable alternative to a carbon intensive resource-focused economy, which is what we've been based on. Um, it involves getting the research, creating mechanisms to get more of our research and our research-talented people out of post-secondary institutions into working in industry. It involves creating uh, research nets, what Edelgard called innovation nets, what other people called clusters of firms in, with, with strong local capabilities to work on these. 
There are no shortage of uh, positive programs. Uh, an expanded version of IRAP in Canada, the SBIR program that uh, Nobina was talking about. Um, there is a hidden gem in the Canadian S&T policy arsenal that no one ever talks about. It's actually called Sustainable Technologies Development Canada. Uh, it, does a, it does a small but reasonably good job of getting those kinds of firms funded. I've been interviewing firms that are actually using it, drawing upon it to develop completely novel and new technologies. But we need, uh, I agree with you, we need a new machinery of government to make innovation the central focus. And hopefully, uh, I think what we all pray for is a government uh, sometime later this year that will actually want to make this a focus of its economic policy. Thank you for your attention.